Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Navid Lancaster on July 11, 2023. Navid is a musician, music producer, and the owner of Landcast Limited, an independent company that creates music for film, animation, video games, and mobile applications. Navid tells his story about learning the guitar as a teenager to working with Kenny Phillips and Proden Studio before striking out on his own. He tells the incredible story of his start in the business by handing out a rudimentary business card to Steven Taylor and shortly after being asked to score the award-winning film Buck the Man Spirit. I started the interview by asking Navid where he grew up and what was spiritual life like growing up. I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, born and raised. Uh, Actually, Trinidad and Tobago is a twin island republic. So I was born on the larger island, which is Trinidad, and I have been here all my life. You know, of course, I visited a couple of places, that kind of thing, but I'm what they they call a born and bred Trini. Yeah. All my my life was growing up. I was born some second generation Baha'i. My dad found out about the Baha'i faith when he was in the army in the late 50s, early 60s, around thereabouts. Introduced it to to my mom, of course, and I'm second generation. You know, he was the first first generation. Along with a a lot of Baha'is, they had a a massive growth of the Baha'i faith in the 70s in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of membership. So he was on that wave of of membership. And I've born and grew up in in the tenets of the Baha'i faith ever since. How did music become a part of your life growing up? It's actually separate parts in terms of that. I was and still am a great listener of music. I've always loved music and it is always a part of a way of of my self-expression. I actually remembered the very first song, actually, I remember singing. I'm, I'm going to back my memory. It was it was the greatest love of all, but it was the George Benson version. That's to show you how old I am. I'm <laughs> dating myself here, I guess. Mm. But I remember singing that when I was by heart, when I was very young. And then my dad had a lot of uh, vinyl back in the day, a lot of 45s. 45 records, LPs. So I got exposed to a lot of music, obviously from his his tastes. So it was like a lot of disco music, a lot of 70s pop music, that kind of thing. And of course, some some music that was that's older than that, you know, from the 50s and stuff. But in terms of my self-expression, that came actually rather late. I started playing instruments notably guitar at the ripe old age of 19 and basically i said ripe old age because i i know usually instrumentalists they start like ages three four five i started at 19. the basic story of that is that i was home during that time and my sister, she went out to work. She actually got a, her guitar. It's a nylon string classical guitar, which, by the way, I still have to this mm. day. That's my first guitar. Mm. But before it became my guitar, uh, it was hers. And when she used to go to work and stuff like that, I used to steal into her room and play the guitar. And I became obsessed with it. And then one day she just found out and she got really mad. And she said, you know, here, take it, take the guitar. Mm. So I was one of those guys who, when I lock onto something that I really like, I become very obsessed with it. So I was playing guitar, practicing guitar, up to like 18, 19 hours a day, sleeping with the guitar on my bed, that kind of thing. 
From there, I found a band called Broken Mirrors because I was teaching guitar at the time and I formed a band with one of these students. And we lasted for about 12 years, you know, that band called Broken Mirrors. And during that time, we were playing things like rock, metal, thrash metal, speed metal, combining local music, like Calypso and soca music and stuff like that, and combine it with the metal. And then from there, I was also into computers. I love my tech. I'm a tech head. I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. I have no problem saying that. And I just figured out during that time when I was working out, I'm skipping a few years here, Mm -hmm. but I was working as the assistant secretary to the National Baha'i Center in my late teens, early 20s. And I was in the office at the time and I saw a television program, that a morning television program with a guy named Kenny Phillips, who was a music producer. And that piqued my interest. I called the station, the television station, and they said, you know, he just left, but here's his number. And I gave him a call and he said, if you really want to do this passionately, leave your job. So. During that time, I left my job and started my career doing studio work. Well, I guess your band, Broken Mirrors, was when your professional musicianship began. Did you guys cut any albums? Yeah, we did one album Mm -hmm. called The Eighth Year. It was the first rock album to be registered in the National Library system here. The reason why we call it the eighth year, because our band is called Brook Mirrors, so, you know, the seven years bad luck, so the year <laughs> after should be good luck, you know, so that's why it's called the eighth year. And what caused the band to break up? Oh, we just got older and, you know, mm-hmm. people got married, you know, mm-hmm. jobs, that kind of thing. So right. I look at it more as a disillusionment of the band. We realized life took us in various directions. So we said, okay, you know, it, it was a good run, 12 years. Some of us continued in our music career. Some of us continued in a music slash cultural aspect of our culture. And some of us left the music industry altogether. We actually have a WhatsApp group. We keep in touch also through other various forms of social media. So yeah, we haven't really lost touch. We still like what we do. It's just that life has taken all the members in various directions. So tell me about the beginnings of your studio work. Oh, yeah. Well, the interesting thing is that when I was working at the National Baha'i Center, this was just before Windows 95 came out. So I was working on a computer at the time, monochrome screen. I used to type in in DOS. So... Mm -hmm. For those who are that age or are into computers, they know what I'm talking about. This is some some years back. When Windows 95 came out, I I cried tears of joy. It was much easier to use. But from that time, I realized that you can combine working with a computer and music. And the interesting thing is when I left my job and went to Kenny Phillips Studio, It was a very harsh introduction to the world of of music production. And the reason why I said that is because I thought when I left my job and went to him, and it was a leap of faith as well, of course, because I left my first, or actually my second job, the working in National Bay Center was my second job. And to leave there, to go into this realm of music, or this aspect of music, was a total gamble for me. But I, I I really thought this was the correct move for me at the time. And when I went to Kenny Phillips' studio, he put me not in front of a Windows system. He put me in front of a Mac system, Macintosh, uh, yeah. and with two paying clients and the clock ticking. That mm-hmm. is how I got introduced to it. When he, he told me that he was going to train me the way how he was trained, I thought he was going to say, okay, this button is for that and that button is for that. And it will give me a nice gradual thing. No, I got I got it real old school, the military way of doing it. Meaning that since I was a new guy, I had to make the tea, the coffee, be the first in the studio, last to leave. 
And during that time, it wasn't really last to leave because he lived so far from where I was. It was not practical for me to take transport. So I used to sleep in the studio, sleep on the studio floor. So it was very harsh. Looking back, I would not trade that type of training for a soft entrance into the industry. I got chastised by various clients, chastised by him because I wasn't on the ball, I wasn't moving things fast enough. So it was a very real sink or swim situation. And he said he, he was going to have me for three months. And if I made the cut, I would stay. If I didn't make the cut, I'd have to go. Of course, I did not make the cut oh. <laughs> after three months. Yeah. But luckily, when I left there, I landed another job, another studio, which even though they had their quirks and they, trust me, they had a lot of quirks, it wasn't harsh like what I just came from. And it was still the Macintosh environment. But at least this time, I was able to start creating music that was more to my tendencies at the time. So that particular studio was called Pruden. They dealt more with advertising agencies and these kind of things. So I was creating a lot of music for commercials or recording the voiceovers for the commercials. With the first studio, at least now with that first experience, I was more proficient in doing this quote unquote easier task. And then from there, I left and worked in another studio called Shore Sound Recording Studios. And that's where my progress really started to ramp up because I worked there for six years. I ran both the studios A and B. Mm -hmm. I did a truckload of commercials. I did so many commercials there. From there, I was able to work with clients, albeit it wasn't the music that I grew up, you know, listening to or played. The studio was actually part of a, a company called Spectacular Promotions, and they are a company that specializes in shows dealing with calypso music and soca music and stuff like that. So I dealt with a lot of Calypsoanians, uh, recorded their tracks, sometimes produced some of their work mixed their work, prepared it for radio broadcast. So I did a lot of that for six years. Even though it ended very bad for me there, I, I didn't want to be there anymore when I left. At least I had the six years under my belt and I started to network and grow my network in terms of clientele. And I also learned how to manage the emotions of the artists, especially in the studio, to bring the best out of them, which is good because I left there and I worked at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. I worked there for four years, co-managing the music technology department. So there, my co-workers and lecturers, we were teaching students the basics of music technology, proper recording techniques, live recording, mixing, mastering, and production. So I fit in very well. During that time, I decided to go more into my education. So I, I got my BTEC in media and communications, and then I studied uh, under the University of Greenwich in England. We have the partnerships with schools in England, the school I went to. So I got my bachelor's in media and communication, and then I went on to another university affiliate, uh, the University of Leicester, uh, and I got my master's in new media and society. I started to combine my joy of playing computers and media. At a certain point, you started your own, would we call it a production company? Very small, very active production company. So was that soon after you finished at the University of Leicester? Yeah, it was germinated from there, but not before I finished uh, my master's. It was during that time... I was under a lot of stress in terms of where I worked at the time, way not enough sleep. My health was being affected really badly. And I decided, okay, let me strike out on my own. And the interesting thing is, I actually bought it through one of the live sessions that I was having while I was working at the university. I was in a club uh, managing the live sound of a band and a guy just walked in with his fiance at the time and he set up a camera. 
And I just walked up to him and said, my name is Navid Lancaster. And he said, hi, my name is Stephen Taylor. Okay, this is cool. I had just these makeshift business cards at the time. I gave him one and didn't think nothing of it until a couple of months later, he called and said he was doing a film and he wanted to know if I could score the music for the film. And I said, okay, this makes sense. I mean, I deal with computers, I deal with music. I've been producing and recording for uh, you know a number of years. So just a matter of adding video to that component, no big deal. Did it, and it was a totally, totally new experience to me. I had to learn many things very fast. By the time we were done, and that was in 2012, that film ended up winning the People's Choice at the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival. And the name of that film is called Buck the Man Spirit. Buck, by the way, is uh, part of Caribbean folklore, where somebody will go into a forest and capture this very small creature. And the creature will make you very rich and give you a lot of good luck. But the catch is you have to feed it every hour. And if you don't feed it every hour, very, very bad things could happen to you including death. So that film, that short film, actually caused a sensation in Trinidad and Tobago during the film festival, so much so that we actually had to have extra screenings of the film. And it went over very well. And the year after, 2013, I did another film called Jab in the Dark. That film I composed for, and that film won that year. And when that happened, I composed two winning films back to back. I was fortunate. I decided to market myself as the premier film composer in Trinidad and Tobago. So I I started to go to all the newspapers and (laughs) literally say that, saying that if you if you want to win an award, the film has to pass through my hands. I literally said that (laughs) in the media. So it's a very blatant marketing technique. But it started to gain traction and almost every year I've been fortunate to actually compose. I started getting to sound design a few years later. So I do both of them, compose and do sound design for award-winning films, video games, mobile applications, and animation. So that that's what I do right now. What is the name of your production company? The name of it is called Landcast Limited. And you have a website. How can people get to your website? What do they type into Google? Lancast, ltd.com, L-A-N-C-A-S-T, L-T-D, dot com. And when you go there, you have a YouTube video Mm -hmm. of films that you've been involved with. There are music score samples in that compilation that really demonstrate your versatility as a film music composer. But I also noticed that as the years progressed in that compilation, that your involvement in the film production seemed to move beyond the film score. For instance, on the film Pan, our music odyssey, you're listed as the technical assistant. And on Sacred Spaces, you're listed as a co-cinematographer. Oh, yes. So it's, (laughs) it's like you even went into filmmaking as your career progressed. Can you describe this progression for us? Yes, I look at things very, even though I'm a a creative, I look at things very logically in terms of what could connect to what to connect to what. So for example, I started playing guitar and then I realized, okay, I do computers as well, combine the music with the computer. Then from there, I see, okay, just add the video component to it. And since I could do that, I can now add the camera work to it because you're just taking the, the, the shots from the camera and putting it in the same computer, which has the same video, which has the same music. So, and the same thing with audio editing, editing for audio books. Is this, so to me, it's all one and the same. It's just... The core of it is myself playing and then everything else just is a, a attachment to it. So for me, it's not a, an abstract concept to bring something in. 
it's just a matter of how it connects to what I already do and then to streamline the process to make it easy, not just for myself, but for the client's peace of mind. Now, Navid, you are involved in an organization called Stage 32. Can you yes. tell us about Stage 32 and what your involvement in that organization is? Okay, well, first thing, uh, and I'm happy to say, because I actually just found out, we have just hit 1 million members worldwide, which is awesome. Uh, Stage 32 is the world's largest educational hub for creatives in terms of film, video, and anything in between. We have everybody from students to Academy and Oscar winners. So that whole range. And basically who I am, I'm one of the ambassadors for Stage 32. And in the Composer Lounge, I'm also one of the community thought leaders in Stage 32. And once in a while, I do write blogs for the organization as well in terms of various aspects of my experience in the world of composing. It's a very active, vibrant community. I usually tell people, because it's free to sign up, and you just basically get yourself involved and network. That's the main thing. It's a networking environment where you could go into the various lounges. They have lounges for screenwriters, producers, musicians, distributors, financiers, and, and everybody else, Our actors as well, of course. And you get in there and you become involved, getting lounges. It has, it has courses and webinars, of course, which are, some are free, some are paid, and you just get yourself involved and grow your network and grow your knowledge. That's basically how they were able to grow this large. Navid, what projects are you currently working on? Ah, okay. I could only mention one. The others, unfortunately, I can't mention because of NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. Sure. <laughs> So the one that I can mention, it actually just came across today, is basically I'm doing a sound design for an animation. So I'm actually, after this interview, I'm actually going to open up the email because I, I just, uh, they just told me it's in the mail. So I now don't even know what the full story is on that. Mm. But the good news is that while that is going to go on later tonight, uh, later this month, I will be part of a film camp. I actually went in, today is Tuesday. I went in yesterday, which was the first day of the film camp. The students are from the ages of 14 to 17, and they are going through the, all the two main major stages of film production. So they'll be doing the pre-production, production stage, and the post-production. I, I will be teaching the post-production stage and give my lecture on it on the third week of the camp. The nice thing about it is that they already broken themselves up into groups because it's about 25, no, actually about 30, 30 students in the camp. And I've seen they have about five groups. So I'll be dealing with those five groups, getting them to do music for their shorts. Their shorts are, are extremely short. I mean, like two to three minute films they'll be putting together and of course, assisting them in the sound design. And then from what the main lecturers have told me, they want to have these films broadcast in theater and also in television. So when I get the films and the stems, the audio layers of each film, I'll be mixing it to prepare it for those two broadcast formats. So yeah, that is very exciting to teach the younger generation the aspects of film and the viability of getting into the industry, and of course, letting their imagination run wild in terms of what they're going to create. So I'm really looking forward to what these young people are going to produce. Now, Navid, I understand you love the Japanese language. How did that I, happen? It happened very strangely. I literally got up one day I mean, Navi, learn Japanese, learn Japanese, learn Japanese. And I, I did not know why. It did not make sense to me. And I put it off for months. And one day I just got fed up and I went <laughs> to the band, Broken Mirrors, which I, who I already mentioned. 
And I said, I, this keeps nagging me all the time. You know, my mind keeps telling me to learn Japanese. I do not know why. So my keyboardist, he said, yeah, they have Japanese classes in the university in a department called the Center of Language Learning. So I signed up, took a course there. Of course, this is like many years ago now. I took a course there. And when I went to the University of Trinidad and Tobago, started working there, I ended up working with uh, two Japanese nationals that were there. So you never know when a conscious keeps bothering you to do something to do it. And I think one of the reasons why I got employed there is because I went to those classes as well. You know, so the, the music technology department was run by four people at the time. Uh, it was two locals and two Japanese uh, nationals. Well, Navid, I want to thank you so much for taking this time to share your story and your work with us. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Navid Lancaster, musician, music producer, and the owner of Landcast Limited, an independent company that creates music for film, animation, video games, and mobile applications. You can find Navid at LandcastLimited.com. That's LandcastLTD.com. And you can find this interview and other interviews on the website abahaiperspective.com. You can find the podcast on iTunes, YouTube, and Spotify. To complete the hour, I play some of Navid's creations. The first piece is the theme music of the series of short stories by author and full-stack designer Anthony Phils for his On the Edge of Night series. That was the theme to the On the Edge of Night series composed by Navid Lancaster. The next piece by Navid are cues from the award-winning short film Immune.
What we just heard were musical cues from the award-winning short film Immune, composed by Navid Lancaster. The next piece is track three from the album The Gate, a nine-part chronological album on the life of the Bob, spelled B-A-B, a miraculous historical Iranian figure that marks the commencement of the Baha'i faith in 1844. The album was released in 2019 for the bicentennial anniversary of the birth of the Bob. Again, this piece is composed by Navid Lancaster.
We just played track three from the album The Gate, composed by Navi Lancaster. The Gate is a nine-part chronological album on the miraculous life of the Bob, whose life in many respects parallels that of Jesus in the Gospels, and who inaugurated the Baha'i faith in 1844. The next composition by Navid Lancaster is part of a soundtrack for the 2023 play Anansi and the Book of Night, written by Rubadiri Victor. We just listened to Navi Lancaster's soundtrack score to the 2023 play A Nancy and the Book of Night, written by Rubadiri Victor. The next piece composed by Navi Lancaster is his entry to the rescore competition for the animation Spring. This was for the 2021 score relief competition hosted by the QTube. Score relief is also raising funds in support of the backup hardship fund which provides relief to technical workers and their families in the entertainment industries who have lost income or experienced other difficulties as a result of the recent pandemic.
We just heard Navi Lancaster's entry to the Rescore competition for the animation Spring. The next piece is Navi Lancaster's Rescore composition for the short film trailer Ocean, which highlights the beauty and grandeur of the ocean, its wildlife, and our relationship to it. We just heard Navi Lancaster's Rescore composition for the short film trailer, Ocean. I hope you enjoyed this program featuring Navi Lancaster, musician, music producer, and the owner of Landcast Limited, an independent company that creates music for film, animation, video games, and mobile applications. You can find Navid at LancastLTD.com. That's LancastLTD.com. And you can find this interview and other interviews on the website of BahaiPerspective.com, as well as on iTunes, YouTube, and Spotify. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website Baha'i.org or call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you'll join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. Mm-hmm.